just as a reminder to everyone, the sessions are recorded. Uh, so we'll have a record of both the videos and the chat after the fact uh, for anyone who'd like to check them out. Uh, now I would like to just welcome everyone to the third and final day of C-Search 2020. Uh, for those of you who may not have been here yesterday or the day before, uh, my name is Alex Salgo and I've been honored this year with being C-Search's head chair. Uh, we've had a couple of fantastic days so far and we're really looking forward to ending things strong today. Uh, we've had, we have talks with brilliant students, uh, panel covering career options, and at the end of the day we do have awards for both the best poster and the best presentation being awarded. Uh, but to start the day off, we're actually going to have a talk from our wonderful Queen's professor, Ting Hu. Uh, Ting is a professor of computing here at Queen's. Her research has focused on bio-inspired computing, bioinformatics, and she's done some really mind-blowing work in those areas. Uh, her research focuses on applying machine learning to biological data in brand new ways, and we're really lucky to have her speak here today. Uh, so without further ado, Ting, I'll pass the floor over to you, and you can take us through some of that. Thank you so much for the introduction, Alex. So I will share my screen. Here we go, looking good. All right. There we go, okay. we can see the slides well. All right, okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in on a Sunday morning. First, I really would like to thank C-Search for inviting me, and it, it is my great pleasure to give this talk today. We uh, all enjoyed Professor Yashua Benjo's keynote on Deep Learning on Friday. Today, I'm going to talk about another AI approach, which was also inspired by nature. So I would like to start the story with a research project I have been working on recently. Metabolism is this complex biochemical process where what we eat and drink are converted into energy and building blocks for our cells to function. A large number of biochemical reactions are taking place simultaneously in metabolism. Some substrates are consumed by these reactions, reactions and some are produced. These small molecules are called metabolites and they are the footprints of those complex biological processes in our body. Many of today's predominant complex diseases have been found to have a clear metabolic cause. This was one of the motivations of the new field, metabolomics, where researchers quantitatively measure the concentrations of hundreds of metabolites in body fluid samples and analyze their distributions, comparing diseased and healthy individuals. Researchers look for metabolites that can best explain the disease status and use them to investigate their represented biological processes, such that we can better understand the diseases and design better drugs and treatments. So this is a typical workflow of a metabolomic study. First, the body fluid samples are taken from diseased individuals and healthy controls. Then high precision techniques such as mass spectrometry or NMR are used to detect the quantities and the concentrations of a large number of metabolites in the samples. These data are further processed and cleaned up for machine learning analysis where we selected the most relevant metabolites, construct and train predictive models, and finally interpret the model in order to extract the knowledge on the data and the disease. This new, this new knowledge is then expected to inspire new drug development and clinical actions that can help us treat, predict, and even prevent those diseases. The last task of machine learning and knowledge extraction is really where my own research focuses on. And I have identified a few challenges in the steps of feature selection, model construction, and model interpretation. In feature selection, we know that not all measured metabolites, often hundreds, are in fact relevant to the disease. We need to select the most relevant metabolites or features. This is often done using a filter algorithm which usually tests the individual association of a metabolite to the disease. There are two shortcomings of such a method. First, the filter algorithm is often independent of the classification algorithm, 
subsequently used to train predictive models. So the selection of the most relevant features is separated from using them to train a classifier. Second, given the complexity of diseases and the biochemical processes, metabolites are more likely dependent on each other and testing them one at a time may overlook such a dependency. In model construction, oftentimes the predictive model has an assumed form, such as a linear form or a polynomial form. Then the predictive model is trained by feeding different parameters or coefficients of this form. Such an assumption may overlook the complexity of, bio, of biology since metabolites could correlate and interact in a highly nonlinear way. In the model interpretation step, if we adopt a more advanced machine learning algorithm, for instance, deep learning to train a nonlinear predictive model, it is often a black box, which is almost impossible to have mechanistic interpretations. Since we cannot gain biological knowledge from the model, despite its good performance, its further clinical applications can be difficult. So what should we do? Now let's have the suspense hanging there for a while and take a step back and look at solving complex problems in a more general sense. Many complex computing problems share the properties that the solution search space is infinite or the number of variables is just overwhelmingly large. Many of these complex problems cannot be solved using well-studied algorithmic paradigms. So unconventional computing methods can be a powerful tool in those cases. Today, I will talk about an unconventional approach inspired by nature. We're all familiar with evolution. It is a theory that explains many fascinating phenomena in nature, including animals that are so bizarre to look at, but when you think about how adaptive they are to their living environments, it all makes sense. Thinking about us, human is also the most amazing creation of evolution. Now think this way, evolution is a very effective optimizer. It optimizes species to adapt to their living environments. Can we engineer evolution? Can we use the idea of evolution to solve computational problems? The answer is yes. Evolution has proved itself as an amazing problem solver in nature. Now let's see if we can decompose its working mechanisms and borrow its principles to design computational algorithms. Darwinian theory on evolution gave us some very solid ideas. Here is the general recipe of evolution. We need to have a population of diverse candidate solutions to a problem. Then we need inheritance. So those good solutions should reproduce and make copies of themselves. Variation is also needed during reproduction. So the offspring will look similar to their parents, but still different. To ensure the pressure on quality, only feeder solutions are selected to reproduce and to survive into the next generation. The last ingredient is time, a lot of time actually, although this is nothing comparing to billions of years natural evolution took, but we may still take hundreds and thousands of generations in our algorithms to evolve a satisfying solution. Now let's speak the computational language. This is how we formalize an evolutionary algorithm. First, we initialize a population of diverse candidate solutions to a problem, usually randomly. Then we evaluate the fitness of each individual solution. Feeder ones will be selected to reproduce. And then a mixture of parents and offspring may compete. Feeder ones will survive into the next generation and the less feeder ones die out. Such an iterative process repeats for hundreds and thousands of times until a satisfying solution has been found or our computational resource has run out. Then we terminate the process and output the result. The first time I learned about evolution in computing, I was truly fascinated. The idea of automatically solving a problem through evolution sounded like wonders to me. I decided to research on evolution and computing since it is just so unconventional and yet powerful. 
it is also a very creative and interesting approach to work with. So here I'm going to show you um, a little bit of the history of evolutionary problem solving. It actually dated more than half a century ago when Alan Turing first proposed the idea of evolutionary search. Then inspired by the discovery of DNA in the 50s, the idea of using evolution to automate problem solving was in fact proposed independently by research groups from mostly the United States and Europe. These algorithms were given different names by their creators, including evolutionary programming, evolution strategies, genetic algorithm, and genetic programming. In the late 90s, benefiting from more communications among international research groups, the field of evolutionary computation was born, and a unified name was given to any algorithms that use the Darwinian evolution principles. All of these algorithms are called evolutionary algorithms. So now let's look at example problem and see an evolutionary algorithm in action. So the task here is to place eight queens on a chessboard such that no two queens can check each other. That is, no two queens share the same row, column, or diagonal. This is in fact a non-trivial problem. It can be solved using a recursive divide and conquer algorithm. Here, we'll see how straightforward and effective an evolutionary algorithm can be used to solve this puzzle. So first, we need to represent a candidate solution and create many diverse ones to form a population. So how can we represent a solution to this puzzle? The candidate solutions do not need to be valid solutions at this point, and it is the job of evolution to find them. A very natural representation for this problem is a permutation of numbers, one to eight. So if we scan the chessboard by column, then we can use the row number to locate each queen. So for this particular example solution, its representation is like this. So initially, we can randomly generate a population of, say, 20 permutations of numbers one to eight, and just let them evolve. There are two types of variations, mutation and a crossover, like in natural evolution. To mutate a candidate solution, we can randomly pick two numbers in the permutation and swap them. To cross over two parents, we can randomly pick two parents, pick a crossover point, copy the first parts of the parents so the two offspring can inherit the first parts of them, and we can rearrange the rest of the permutation so they follow the same order in one of the parents. Evolutionary algorithm is a really effective solution to this problem. We can solve this puzzle in less than 15 generations. So when you think about how, how interesting this method works, it's a really blind technology. So when, when we perform mutation and a crossover, they're really random and stochastic. So what, how everything works is when we have all the pieces together and when we put selection pressure on quality, and gradually we're gonna see some really interesting and high quality solutions to a problem. And you can tell we can easily modify an evolutionary algorithm to solve a different problem. So for instance, this one, we can easily change the algorithm we just wrote to solve any other problems that use a permutation as a candidate solution. For instance, the traveling salesman's problem. So we can use a permutation to represent the route how this uh, traveling salesman visits different cities. And then we just need to change the fitness function instead of to minimize the number of pairs of queens that check each other for a traveling sales problem we just need to minimize the total path length and then we can convert this evolution algorithm to solve a different problem evolution algorithms have some really unique and interesting features first it is very creative the quality of a candidate solution is measured based on a numerical value a fitness value However, how to achieve that fitness is in the hand of evolution. Oftentimes, evolution gives us surprising but effective solutions. 
Second, evolution is ever a stagnant process, and so can the algorithms. The algorithms can effectively adapt to a changing condition, a different fitness function, without much human intervention. Third, unlike many other algorithms that find one solution to a problem, this population-based search in evolutionary algorithms often can provide a collection of equally good solutions. These diverse solutions can be really useful for problems with further constraints. Evolution algorithms have been applied to solve numerous problems in very diverse fields. So the first example I'm gonna show here today um, is to evolve an antenna that flew on NASA's space technology mission. This antenna was a surprising and yet effective design which does not follow engineering rules, but perform extremely well. The second example is these um, robots. They can adapt quickly to damage and think outside of the box to find a, a alternative behavior to compensate to the damage. The heart of this robotic design is also an evolutionary algorithm. The second example is a vertical farming study where using evolutionary algorithm discovered an optimal growth recipe for basil. The original human expert recipe puts a six hour constraint on the UV exposure for basil growth, considering that plants may also need to, may also need the circadian rhythm. The evolutionary algorithm found out that a 24 hour UV exposure was able to maximize the flavor of basil of course, when the fitness is set to optimize the flavor. So I hope now you have a better understanding on evolutionary computing and are also excited about it. Now, remember the metabolic, metabolomic project and its challenges I talked about in the beginning? Now it is time to show how we address those challenges using an evolutionary algorithm. In this context, now each individual in the evolutionary population is a symbolic uh, predictive model represented as a computer program. Values are stored, manipulated, and passed using registers. So for instance, here we have two registers, one and a two, they take input values, that is concentration levels of two metabolites, and R0 is this designated output register. Um, so the final value stored in R0 will be the program's final outcome. And it will be mapped to predict the disease risk. Essentially, such a program can represent a highly nonlinear relationship that maps the inputs to the output. Then we use a population of such randomly produced programs to start and then we go through the evolutionary process. The fitness of a program is evaluated based on its classification performance. Note that although we provide a full set of metabolites measured in the data for our evolutionary algorithm to use as inputs, not all of them may be picked when a program is randomly generated in the initial population, and some input registers may be removed or deactivated in a program during evolution as a result of mutation or recombination. Therefore, the selection of the input metabolites is co-evolved with the predictive models. Using such an evolutionary algorithm, we're able to address these three questions related to those challenges we identified before. We applied this evolutionary algorithm to an osteoarthritis metabolomic data, and here I'm gonna show you some interesting results. The first question we would like to answer is what features or what metabolites are the most influential in terms of making predictions. So here is the results applied to um, from the osteoarthritis metabolomic data. So we divided the data into two um, subsets. One is for discovery and one is for um, replication. We run the evolutionary algorithms and we counted how many times one particular metabolite appears in the best final evolved predictive models. The hypothesis is that if one metabolite appears more often than the others, maybe it is more influential in the prediction. So it has a high correlation with the disease. So by looking at this figure, 
we were able to identify some known metabolites that have already been discovered related to osteoarthritis. We were also able to find some novel metabolites that have never been discovered before um, related to osteoarthritis. The second question is, does a feature contribute individually or through interacting with others? So not only we want to know what metabolites are the most important, we also want to know how, how they contribute to the prediction. So we counted the co-occurrence of pairs of metabolites in the best final evolved predictive models, and we constructed this synergy network. In this network, each node is a metabolite, and the node size is proportional to individual occurrence frequency, so the individual importance of a metabolite. Two metabolites are connected by an edge if their co-occurrence, their pairwise co-occurrence frequency is higher than the average. And again, the width of an edge is proportional to the co-occurrence frequency. So this, this, this network provides a global overview on um, what metabolites are more important and how they in interact with each other. Um, there are some quite interesting observations on this network. First, the degree distribution of this network follows a heavy tail distribution. That is, most of the metabolites have a relatively low degree, but there are some of them have degrees much higher than the average. And we also found some metabolites, for instance, this one, C181. This one has a moderate size on its own. So it has a moderate individual effect. However, it has a high degree. So it is interacting with many other metabolites. So this means if we use a univariable analysis, very likely we are going to overlook metabolites like this. They are important in the sense that they interacting with, they're interacting with a lot of other metabolites. And here is the distribution comparison of this one metabolite in the case, disease, the cases, and healthy controls. So we can see those two distributions overlap heavily. Um, again, so if we just look at this one metabolite at a time, individually, we're not gonna, to, we're not gonna find it. And then the last question is, what is the underlying biological mechanism? Can we have a, more compact predictive model that we can interpret? So the answer is yes. So we um, found this really compact, short genetic program that where we can convert it to a decision tree. So it boils down to the comparison of two pairs of metabolites. And um, this, this, this would be something really potential for generating hypothesis to better understand this disease, because all we need to do is comparing those two metabolites and we can make a really highly accurate prediction. The accuracy of this predictive model is actually um, 97%. So we have achieved some really interesting results and, and found some um, quite exciting um, new metabolites and new insights into the disease. There are also a lot of things ahead of us that we need to take a look at. The first one is um, for biomedical research, a close collaboration is really the key. We need to have this communication between people with from different backgrounds. Um, so who designed the methodology and who collect the data and who are the experts on the disease and the phenotype. So we can all work together and then we can look at the results and try to validate them and make sense of them. Data integration is also important. So we all know biology is complex. It's very um, likely that we need to collect data from different levels and then put them together to have a more complete picture of um, the causes um, to different phenotypes and the diseases. And the model instability, high dimensionality, these are all challenges related to applying machine learning to biomedical problems. 
And I want to just focus a little bit on the interpretation and the explanation um, using machine learning models. So these has been um, some topics I have been working on recently. I truly believe that for machine learning and AI approaches to work for biomedical computing, we need to have more customized and tailored machine learning methods. We need to understand how a machine decision has been made and how can we learn better, um, more knowledge from applying a machine learning algorithm. Making the high, highly accurate prediction is important, but I believe for biomedical applications, it is more important for us to gain more knowledge um, and really truly understand the data and the problem. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my lab members, my machine intelligence and the biocomputing lab at Queens. So these are the students who have been working with me on this project or who are currently working on this project. Thank you very much for everyone um, who are involved in this, in this research. And finally, I would like to thank you, um, everybody, for tuning in on a Sunday morning. Um, I hope you enjoy the story. And please let me know if you have any questions and um, comments. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, Ting. Uh, that was a phenomenal presentation. And I think that there's a, I mean, I personally don't have a whole lot of background in evolutionary algorithms. Uh, so it was nice to get to, to learn a little bit about that and how that can be applied to a real biological field. Uh, while we give people a chance to, uh, to think through that and, and figure out if they have any questions about it, um, I, I will we'll wait on anyone who has any. You can post them right in the chat. Um, I have a question myself, actually. Uh, okay. that I had um, and it was about obviously with evolutionary algorithms there's uh, you have a whole bunch of variables that you're changing from generation to generation um, do you know if there's any work in that field that involves trying to learn correlations between the different variables that you're evolving do you kind of have to assume that you know in advance which ones should be correlated or is there any work to learn it generation after generation that maybe the first variable and the third variable should actually be related in some way? Yeah, um, so this relates to a really important research topic, parameter tuning in evolutionary algorithms. So well, yeah, because evolutionary algorithm is notorious in a way that it has so many parameters that you have to tune to make your algorithm actually work. Um, and that's one of the major reasons why some people actually shy away from using the evolutionary algorithm because it really needs and some expertise um, on designing the algorithm and setting the parameters. So um, there are some, of course, rule of thumbs, like how you should set different parameters to, to make an evolutionary algorithm work. And another approach to, is to evolve those parameters as part of your solution. That makes sense yeah. applying evolution to both sides of it. Yeah, exactly. So we can co-evolve the parameters of the algorithm with the solution that we are looking for. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, we'll, we'll wait another moment to see if anyone has any specific questions about anything. Um, and if not, we'll rejoin at the in about half an hour for the uh, next set of student presentations. Okay. So let's wait a moment, see if anyone has anything at the last minute. All right. Uh, we've got a question from Meroan um, asking, as the predictive models are generated through different generations, is there an optimization process being undertaken, something that's akin to gradient descent and deep learning, or is it solely based on stochastic permutations of the parameters? Mm -hmm. So the predictive models are generated randomly in the initial population. Um, so the process is we can set a length of this program, say we want to have 10 instructions in this program. And then for each instruction, we just randomly pick a register as the return and the two registers as the um, operands and one function as the operator. And then we just repeat that process until we have reached the length that we had in mind, like 10 instructions. So that's how we produce one program. It's really, 
it's really random. It's a really blind technology and you will be really amazed um, by how actually this algorithm works. It's all in the hand of evolution because we have like how we put all the pieces together. So by mutation, we can just randomly change a register, um, could be the return or the operands or the function. Um, by crossover, we can pick two parent programs and then we can take one crossover point and then just swap their information. Um, so what, right? And then we have to use selection to, to put some pressure on the quality. Otherwise, those random changes, they're most likely gonna be um, harmful. So they're not, they're not, they're not going to be to create more adaptive solutions. So a lot of those changes are going to be removed from the population, but those good ones, they will be saved. Um, and crossover is this, is this really interesting recipe um, for evolutionary algorithm. When you think about many other optimization problems and even AI techniques, they only improve one solution. Right, but for evolution algorithms, th this is a population-based search. It means that we could have hundreds and even thousands of individuals searching in their local area, but by using recombination, we can have this big jump in the search space. We can recombine building good building blocks from quite different areas in the search base, and then they will give us like a like a really big leap when you look at the evolutionary progress. That's how those big leaps happens. And a brand new, really good solution has been found. And when you think about it, that's what happens in natural evolution as well. So most of the time we don't see much on the surface. There's a lot of mutation going on. There's a lot of changes going on. But when once in a while, especially when the environment has changed, we see this big leap, right? So it's the same idea in evolutionary algorithm. Excellent answer, I think. Uh, and I actually had another question myself. Uh, yeah. Sorry to, to dominate as everyone. Uh, but if regarding evolutionary algorithms and specifically uh, determining how good the answer, the solutions are, because obviously at each step you're saying one of the big parameters that you're dealing with is how you're is determining which ones are the best and which which ones we're going to keep versus discard. Um, is Could you talk a little bit about what goes into that into determining the specifics of how you're going to discard one solution versus keep another one? Right, yeah. So in fact, this selection process is also um, not deterministic. So we never rank all the individuals based on their fitness and just say, we're gonna take the first half and then they'll, they'll be the survivors. So if we do that, the evolution will be really directed and then the algorithm will converge really quickly on a local optima. So they won't be able to jump out. So we have to allow more randomness and stochasticism in our algorithm. So what we do is, um, I don't know if you, you are familiar with the roulette wheel game, right? So what we do is we sort of, we calculate the probability of um, one individual that will survive or picked as a parent. So the fitter that individual is, the more chance that an individual will get, but that's not guaranteed. And then we have this, we spin the wheel and then we'll just see where the, the, the pointer actually is located. So those feeder ones, they will have a better chance to be picked up. But still, you could have really, like a really good quality solution can have really bad luck and it get removed from the population. So that's how we can ensure in this really nice balance between randomness and um, um, quality. So we can make sure the algorithm is going towards the right direction, but still we wanna allow stochasticism and keep the, the, the population as diverse as possible. Thank you very much. And we actually, we have a question from uh, Keith here. Uh, he says, forgive me if I missed uh, this point in the talk, but can you elaborate on finding the causalities or proofs inside the black box of evolutionary algorithms? Are we able to provide clear causal relationships when applying these algorithms on behalf of a client, for example? Uh, how strong is the explainability of these algorithms, I guess, is the core of the question. Right, yeah. So I use the black box here to refer um, to um, many of those predictive models learned by more advanced machine learning techniques. For, each, for instance, deep learning, the more complex a problem is, the more complex that learned deep neural net 
architecture would be. Um, it could be so complex to a point that there's just no way we can figure out how it works and how the decision has been made. There are some work that has been done to try to understand what variables, like what inputs are more influential, kind of, kind of like what we did here. But that's pretty much it. There's just a lot of work that needs to be put in that direction. Um, for evolution algorithms, we could have multi-objectives. So first one is we want to ensure the quality. So we can use prediction accuracy as one objective, similar to deep learning. We could use the compactness of a model as another objective. So we can drive evolution to find small yet accurate solutions. And when we have that, because the programs, if they're shorter, it will be easier for us to convert that into a more interpretable format, like a decision tree, right? That's what we showed in the slides. So if they can be represented as a decision tree with, I don't know, maybe less than five levels, then it, it's easy to understand how that uh, prediction is being made. We compare two pairs of features, and if that's the case, we go to one branch. So they're just more interpretable in that sense. Makes sense. And that, that makes it clear that at least there are ways to tell how explainable the results that you're getting are at the very right. least, uh, which yeah. is definitely a useful factor. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, if we have any other questions, I'll give another moment and then uh, otherwise we'll head on. Keith would like to thank you for your answers. That's a great answer. Oh, you're very welcome, Keith. Excellent. Well, I think that that's all the questions we have. Uh, so thank you again so much, Ting, for coming and explaining your work to us and the kind of things that you're doing. Uh, and we'll see everyone, I suppose, uh, in about 20 minutes for the start of the next student presentation. So thank you again, Ting.